1034 on a Tuesday morning. Good morning. This is the TDN Writers Room. I'm Bill Finley, your host this week. Drew in off the also eligible list when Joe Bianco was a late scratch on the advice of the track veterinarian. Jonathan Green, General Manager for DJ Stable, and I am so excited for the Keeneland Mini Meet. Let's get it on. Uh, Brian Dinata, racing editor at the TDN and managing partner of Franklin Ave Equine. And I was a very last second addition to this podcast, so I hope I don't ruin it for everybody. And we remind you that this TDN Writers Room podcast is brought to you by Keeneland. And a reminder that wagering through Keeneland Select supports Keeneland's efforts to give back to the thoroughbred industry as profits are reinvested back into the sport through purses, fan development, player rewards, and more. Sign up at KeenelandSelect.com. And I'm sure everybody's aware the very special Keeneland Summer Meet kicks off Wednesday and runs through Sunday. It includes 10 graded stakes races, among them the Toyota Bluegrass, the Central Bank Ashland, and the Makers Mark Mile. Last weekend on the racetrack, another huge weekend for Keeneland sales graduates. A bunch of winners, the most prominent, Uncle Chuck in the Los Alamitos Derby, Bacoma, who we're going to talk about a little bit later in the Run Happy Met Mile. Very impressive win for that four-year-old. And in still regard, the winner of the grade one Manhattan at Belmont all Keeneland graduates. So we join now, we're joined now by my compadres and my friends, John Green and uh, Brian DiDonato. And, you know, going over the weekend's racing, there was a lot to talk about, but I, I think everybody would be in agreement. The star of the show was Vacoma. And this is a horse that kind of snuck up on everybody. He was won the bluegrass last year, ran 13th in the Kentucky Derby, and then just sort of disappeared. But he has come back with a vengeance this year, winning the Sir Shack winning the Carter, then winning the Run Happy Met Mile. And, you know, right now he's not really being in the conversation for Horse of the Year. Tis the, uh, tis the Law is dominating things. You also have Maximum Security, you have Midnight Bisu, other horses in consideration. But, I mean, honestly, this horse is putting together a Horse of the Year-like campaign, at least so far through the year. John, your thoughts? No, absolutely. And and Vacoma is is the horse that nobody was talking about at the beginning of the year. Um, and really, if you look back at his at his past performances, he had the one bad race, albeit in the Kentucky Derby. Um, but before that, you know, he won the Bluegrass impressively. He ran a good third in the uh, in the Fountain of Youth and he won the Nashua. Um, so really, he had a relatively spotless record um, coming into this year. And in this year, as a four year old is undefeated and is really peaking now. Um, the thing that, that impressed me so much, aside from the fact he's undefeated in 2020, is that he ran this race, um, the Run Happy Met uh, Mile, 109 and two for six furlongs, and then finished up in 132 and four, just a couple of fifths off the track record, um, which is very impressive. But the thing that's really interesting to me, and Brian, you can probably back me up on this, having attended so many sales, is that if you just saw him coming out of a stall and watched him walk, you know, towards you up and up and back. I don't know if you'd pass him. He's got a really funky right leg kind of flip. Um, when, and when you watch it down the stretch, you go <gasps> every time he, he takes a step. But, man, he explodes and he is just, you know, incredibly fast. So, you know, take that into account when you're when you're at the upcoming sales for the next, uh, you know, for the yearling sales and, and this week's two year old sales that not necessarily every horse that has perfect confirmation or perfect walking um, is going to be a great racehorse and vice versa. Here's a horse that, you know, maybe you wouldn't have uh, kept on your short list because of that funky, you know, kind of wonky um, right flip that he has. But man, he flips it fast and he really explodes. Um, and kudos to, to him and, and, and his group for placing him properly to be undefeated this year. Yeah. Um, I mean, his action is definitely interesting. He's the type of horse where if I was doing, if he was in a two-year-old sale and you were doing notes, he'd probably say, you know, fast, but not sure he'll hold up or something or give him, you know, wonder if he'd vet or something like that, but he just kind of runs his way through it and, you know, runs a hole in the wind. I guess for horse of the year conversation, it might come down to whether they decide to stretch him out now or keep him short. It sounds like they'll probably keep him short. Um, so I'm guessing he'd need a lot of horses to kind of have a disappointing second half of the year to earn the horse of the year honors. But I mean, from a figure perspective, he's got to be probably running the most impressive races uh, of any horse in training right now. And uh, good for George Weaver. Um, you know, he's certainly an exciting horse and it'll be interesting to see what they do with him up in Saratoga. Yeah, now they say they're going to the Forgo next. So it, that's at seven furlongs, of course, at Saratoga. And I guess you could say if it's not broke, why fix it? I mean, this horse has certainly found a home. All these races have been the same, the seven furlong, one mile, one turn races. So, uh, you know, would they at some point try to stretch him out? I think by the, the, the decision to go to the Forgo versus the Whitney, 
probably is an indication that they're not going to. And, you know, for some, some regards, they don't really need to. They won two grade ones uh, right now. Um, he's going to make it as a stallion, no doubt, in Kentucky off a of Met Mile win, a run happy Met Mile win, et cetera. But it would be so much fun to see what he could do if he did try the Whitney, maybe the Woodward, something like that. And then if he passes that test, you could see him as a Breeders' Cup Classic horse. Now, even though he's been so successful this year doing what they've been doing, seven furlongs, seven furlongs, one mile, then back to seven furlongs in the forego, he did win the Bluegrass as a three-year-old. So it's not like he hasn't proven that he can go around two turns and go a distance of ground. Yeah, and his breeding says that that he should be, you know, explosive um, up to a certain point, especially with the Spikestown uh, female, you know, family. Um, so it doesn't surprise me they want to keep him kind of at shorter distances at the at the one turn mile or, or you know even the seven eighths races. Um, but he's the kind of horse that that is explosive. Brian used the term, you know, break uh, running a hole in the wind, and I, I would I would concur. It's a very way, a very good way of putting it. One of the other races that I thought was very impressive was Uncle Chuck, and not just because I picked them in our in our silly contest. Um, but here's a horse now, an Uncle Mo's son, out of an unbridled song, uh, you know, female family that uh, isn't exactly running holes in the wind, but is impressive and running, you know, winning races. Won his first race by seven. Won this race also the uh, Los Alamitos Derby, um, you know, in a hand ride as well. And uh, I think he's still very green. And here's a horse that, under normal circumstances wouldn't even be talking about any of the bigger races at, at this stage of his career. But all of a sudden now he's in contention to, to run in the Kentucky Derby. So, you know, Bafford loses a couple of big horses, ho-hum, all of a sudden Uncle Chuck comes, you know, stepping up and, and now he may have another uh, another contender for the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, I'm like, a, I'm not totally sold on Uncle Chuck yet. Um, I mean, that field that he beat, a thousand words really has been a pretty big disappointment this year. And there wasn't much else in there. Um, you know, he kind of, they kept him way out in the track. I think that's kind of how that track is. Uh, it's better to be out there, but he kind of had an interesting trip, made that kind of big move and kept going and kind of, you know, stiff armed his stable mate in the stretch. Um, I don't know. Just some, I just don't, we'll see. I mean, he's going to get a lot tougher tests next time. Cause he'll either be facing, he's going to be facing one of the big two, uh, depending on if he comes out to, uh, if he comes to New York or if he stays in California. So it'll be interesting when he gets the class test. I'm not sure that he's, on the same level as Baffert's first string, you know, those horses from earlier in the year. But, uh, I mean, got a, he has a big pedigree, lightly raced. He could obviously step forward from here. I think my comment on Uncle Chuck would be related to the Triple Crown as a whole. And when you hear people say, is it easier or is it harder this year, the 15 weeks versus the five weeks? I mean, that's something that is is not a uh, open and shut black and white case. The reason why I say that, in a normal Triple Crown year, Uncle Chuck is not making the triple crown, obviously. And, you know, you have other horses, and maybe we'll, we'll get to him in a second, the other Baffert horse that's drawing some attention, Cezanne, for what he's done um, with, and with that big price tag of $3.65 million on him. So you have horses that, you know, well, the jury's still out. I agree with you, Brian, on how good Uncle Chuck is, mainly because, you know, he didn't beat a very strong field. Um, but, you know, how is this going to impact the Triple Crown? Because he and other, these new shooters, these new waves of horses are coming into the thing. And you wouldn't have seen them in, in a traditional Triple Crown year, which I think, if again, tis the law, wins the Triple Crown. Do you have the asterisk? Do you not have the asterisk? I think people need to keep in mind that, you know, again, I keep saying it's different. That doesn't mean it's easier. So how about Cezanne in here? He was my pick after John Green took Uncle Chuck. Uh, and there's probably about seven or eight Baffert picks uh, out of the... Uh, handful of horses that we've taken in this. Um, right now, um, I'd like to get my pick back. Uh, you know, he is, two, <laughs> he is two for two. And, you know, maybe there is a lot more improvement to come. But he didn't do much in that win at Los Alamitos the other day to really make me think that I snuck in there and got the derby winner in my supplemental round. I mean, everybody knows he won by a length and three-quarter over uh, a horse that just broke its maiden and a maiden claimer. So, John, you want to work out a trade, Uncle Chuck versus on, and I'll give you my first-round draft pick next year? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, John, were you the underbidder on Cezanne? And I can honestly say no, right. that, was, that was not the case. Um, but, yeah, you know, th that was when I was trying to figure out which of the two horses to select. Um, you know, that was part of it was, okay, he's running an allowance race, still wouldn't earn any points and isn't any closer really to the Derby or the Preakness, um, yet versus, uh, uncle Chuck, who was running in the grade three for points. Um, it, you know, if the horse, honestly, if, if, if Cezanne wasn't a $3 million plus purchase and, or, or wasn't with Baffert, I don't even know if we'd be talking about him right now because all he did was win a maiden race and then 
you know, kind of a, an overnight allowance race that they made go for him. Um, so, you know, guys, you answer me that. I mean, if, if, if it wasn't for the price tag or the fact that, that he was in the Baffert barn, would we even be on, would he even be on our radar right now? Yeah, probably not. Um, I guess that's what makes him interesting and makes him, you know, has, has people having these high expectations as you expect him to have a lot of potential. Um, I kind of agree with you guys. He just doesn't seem fast enough at this point. Um, I guess we'll see, but he's not the typical Baffert that just, the, to, you know, the Baffert horses that are monsters are brilliant kind of from the start. And he doesn't seem like that kind of horse, but I mean, a lot of the Curlins are later developing. They certainly appreciate a route of ground. You know, maybe he'll find a mile and a quarter to his liking and run a big race somewhere, but I don't know that he's a superstar at this point. Well, upcoming, of course, the main attention will be uh, on the um, meet at Keeneland, also at um, Belmont, where the Rough and Monomoy girl goes. Now, John, it's only a grade two. If she wins, do you have to put that ad in the TDN congratulating them off of winning the Rough I my word that if she won a, a graded stake race, that I would put an ad in the, in the TDN, and I'm going to stick by it. Damn it. But let's well, let's see if she can win it first. That's he's going to be one to five. So I think you ought to write the check out mm -hmm. right now for that ad, Mr. Green. But anyways, <laughs> um, a couple things that people should know. The Keeneland meet will be streamed on the TDN website, uh, the entire five day meet. And uh, you don't have to have an ADW account. You don't have to pay any fees. You don't have to make up anything like that. If you want to watch the Keeneland stream. It's right on the TDN um, website. Now, uh, one of the interesting stories this weekend at Keeneland will be Swiss Skydiver. Talk about our three-year-old uh, draft. Nobody took this filly and she is nominated for the Triple Crown and Ken McPeak has nominated her for both the uh, Bluegrass and the Ashland. Now, um, the, we'll know the answer tomorrow when the entries come out, but right now it looks like the uh, Bluegrass is going to have a pretty big field uh, with or without a Swiss Skywalker and the Ashland is only going to have four or five horses. McPeak told me earlier in the week that that was one thing he would take into account heavily that if there was going to be a small field in one race and a large one in another, he would opt for the small field. So that may mean he's going to go in the Ashland. I want them to go for it. She'd be the favorite in the bluegrass, no doubt about it. And Ken McPeak is one of those guys out there that's not afraid to do something different and be a little daring. He was talking about taking this horse over to England to run before. He couldn't work it out because of COVID. Um, I'd love to see her take on the boys in the bluegrass. I think she'd beat them. I think it's an interesting debate. I think we can sit here and, and talk about it until entries come out and, and we still wouldn't have a conclusion. Um, one thing I, I respect Ken McPeak as a trainer and I respect him as a manager. He's done very well over the years with not only taking top talent or training top talent, but actually taking them to winning races. Um, and I think that, that this is a tease. I think that he's saying she's good enough to beat the boys, um, but ultimately he's going to land in the Ashland because it is going to be a smaller field. And in, in the breeding industry, if a Philly wins the Ashland or wins the, the Bluegrass, they're both considered in such high esteem uh, in grade one races here in Keeneland that um, I, I don't know if there's very much difference as far as her value, you know, down the road. That being said, as a fan, I would love to see her run, but as a manager of a racing operation, you got to go with the path of, path of least resistance. And if you can win a grade one against four or five other fillies versus 14 other, other boys, you know, you got, you got to go with, uh, you know, with the absolute, I think in this case. What's the purse difference on the, the two races? 600 you know, versus four. 600 Bluegrass, 400 Ashland. Is the Ashland still a grade one? The Bluegrass Ashland is grade, grade two. Grade one, now. Bluegrass is grade two. And she has not, not, has not won a grade one race yet. Yeah, that's right. right. I'm sorry. The Bluegrass is a grade two. So that, that's even yeah. even more evidence as to, as to why I think we go to the Ashland. I mean, that kind of makes it seem like a no-brainer. If she hasn't won a grade one yet, you take the kind of the easy layup. And, right. you know, the 200 grand isn't going to make a difference. Um I guess in some ways it is an interesting year to kind of talk about it. She's pretty much in the Oaks already. So, you know, if they want to take their shot against the boys now, it's not a bad time. But, I mean, I think the grade one versus grade two thing makes a pretty big difference. She's already a multiple grade stakes winner. So, the, you know, the grade one probably holds more value. Um, kind of seems like an obvious spot. It'd be cool to see her against the boys. And I don't think it's that strong a field. It doesn't sound like. Um, so she'd probably fit in well there. But, it's, you know, and – Kudos to Ken McPeak. Like John said, he kind of always thinks a little bit outside the box and is willing to take shots. Um, you know, maybe we'll see her take a shot later in the year or something or try the Preakness, who knows. But uh, for right now, it seems like the Ashland is probably the logical spot. Yeah, it'd be fun to see her go in the Bluegrass. So I think you guys are probably right. She want, uh, winds up in the Ashland. And now a message from our friends at Keeneland.
Owning a multiple graded stakes winning race course like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit our website, westpointtb.com. Well, yesterday on Monday, normally it's supposed to be a quiet day in racing. It was anything but two major stories to get to. And let's start first with the news, uh, not unexpected, that the split samples on the two Baffert runners on Arkansas Derby Day, Gamin and uh, Charlatan, who had uh, tested positive for the drug in lidocaine, Baffert requested the split samples. They came back. They confirmed the positives. And uh, Baffert uh, and his camp is not going to go down without a fight. Uh, they put out a release. And they said that, uh, among other things, that they had an employee who was uh, using um, a salon pause patch for uh, a back pain and that there's lidocaine is, is part of that patch. And they think that through the tongue tie, this person handled the horses and got into their systems. Therefore, uh, they don't believe that Baffert did anything wrong and they are going to fight this penalty. And, uh, you know, you two guys are, are, are owners and, uh, you know, know what uh, can happen with environmental contamination and everything else. My quick take, and I want to get back to it after uh, we listen to Brian and John, is that, um, you know, the, the story of Baffert and his lawyers have put out could absolutely 100% be true. Matter of fact, it probably is. Weird things happen like this, and this is how guys get positives with these kind of drugs. But I don't see any avenue where they can win this. This is, uh, we have the trainer responsibility rule, which has been in place since, you know, the beginning of time in horse racing. It is ironclad. There's no wiggle room. Uh, no matter how that drug got into these horses system, the trainer will have to pay a penalty. So I'm not really sure what the Baffert strategy is here, John. Yeah. And, and, and I'd look at it, you know, again, I'm, I'm from a family of attorneys. So, you know, so you always have to, whenever you read an attorney's statement, you always have to, you know, take it A with a grain of salt and B, understand where the spin is. Um, when this came out, when, when the original announcement came out, that the original split sample um, came back positive for those two horses months ago, I remember sitting here on the podcast and we said, boy, it would really be nice if the Baffert camp had a statement. If they said, we're innocent, this never happened, or maybe it happened with a trace amount, but it wasn't anything that we actually administered to the horses directly whatever. Instead, he said, uh, you know, basically it was like, how did this come out? And I thought I had rights, you know, for, for basically equivalent of HIPAA. Not a great look. The very first statement that Baffert's attorney, Craig Robinson, uh, comes out with is even though, and I'm reading this, even though Latakine is a lawful, widely available therapeutic medication, it was never intentionally administered to either horse. Okay, well, right off the bat, that's not true because lidocaine is, is a banned substance in the industry. You can't use it for anything, you know, within a certain period of time before the races. So it's not a matter of it was Lasix and we gave it too much or it was another medication that, um, you know, that was given too close to the race. Here is a medication that is lidocaine that is not allowed in a horse's system certain time before the races. So right off the bat, I don't think he's being fully truthful or fully forthright with, you know, with, with, with what he's got. Does he have a bad hand? Yeah, he's got a bad hand because, you know, it, it, obviously the split sample must have come back positive also for them to even come out with another comment like this and to have to do a press release. So I think they're going to play it as, well, it wasn't me. Yes, we found the drug in there, but no, it wasn't me that administered it. And this is how the horses got exposed to it. And, uh, you know, and, and, and it's kind of like, well, it's not my problem, but it is your problem. Just like Bill, you said, um, you have trainer's responsibility that anything that, that is um, ingested by a horse in your care ultimately falls, you know, the buck stops with you. Um, I don't know if this story is true or not. Uh, it's, a, it's a good story one way or the other. It's funny how there's always, you know, I mean, we talked about when this came out, I think like the same day there was a Steve Asmussen positive and they blamed urinating, you know, a, a right. groom was urinating in the stall. I mean, I think these guys, I think are, I think the grooms are pretty aware of being careful. And I mean, who knows? I, the, the big thing is we can't prove that part one way or another. And it kind of comes down to this idea that surveillance is very important uh, in policing this stuff. We talked about that when the indictments came out that I think, I mean, you'd have to go back and watch the video. And I don't know that you could really prove one way or another that, this story was true or not, but it would help a lot. And I think that's the big thing that 
Um, I mean, these horses honestly should have, should be, should have a camera on them pretty much all t- at all times in the stall, if you ask me. And uh, I mean, that might, oh, you know, close this case one way or the other pretty quickly, I would think. That's a good point, Brian. And uh, one other thing, and John, uh, I'm stealing some of the things that you told me when we were just chatting this morning, but, you know, again, I'm, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but I can't for a minute believe that Baffert and his attorney really think the Arkansas Racing Commission is ever going to say, oh, gee, it was got from this groom and he got into the tongue tie. You're not guilty. You're not guilty. And uh, go on and have, uh, you know, the rest of your life here. So, you know, what is Baffert's strategy uh, and what is really the end goal uh, for this? And and John, you brought up two points and and I was kind of stealing your thunder, but I'll, I'll give it to you and you can take this. One may be just the timing that if he can delay this until after the Breeders' Cup, uh, then he doesn't have to miss any major races. He can take the penalties in that quiet time of the year. The horses can all run under Jimmy Barnes' name, and he comes back um, in, in, in plenty of time for the 2021 season. The other thing might be, as, as you said, John, um, I mean, he wants to clear his name. And even if he's not exonerated, getting this story out does give people a uh, reason to pause and say, hey, maybe Baffert really didn't do anything um, uh, wrong here. John, oh, I don't know if I've left you much to say, but I, I do want to give you credit because uh, you know, a lot of this was things that you were saying. No, I, I, I appreciate that, Bill. And, and, and it, you know, it was stuff that, that we want to bring up um, because, again, with, with anytime you bring attorneys in, into it, you also question about the timing of, of, the, of the statement. And are they just trying to kick this down the road, just like the split sample got kicked down the road for a number of months um, and, and in reality, if we were all in a non-COVID situation, um, the split sample delay would have been, you know, the results would have been posted after the Triple Crown. Well, now the Triple Crown got delayed. So how do we delay the inevitable of, you know, a penalty process, uh, you know, for, for Baffert and for his camp? Well, now if you, if you delay it long enough through, you know, by fighting it or, or asking for an appeal, then you kick it down the road and maybe you mean... Um, you know, avoids any kind of scrutiny, you know, during her Oaks and, you know, um, uh, the uh, Black Eyed Susan, you know, run as well. So I, I really think, I don't think things happen, you know, by accident or, or you know, by mistake. I think this was all very pre-planned. Um, and, and I know from, well, Ro- excuse me, Craig Robertson's um, law firm, they're the, one of the largest law firms in Kentucky. They know what they're doing. Um, so I'm sure that part of the process was, how are we going to kick this down the road and avoid kind of any kind of negativity towards the horse and towards our client? I think you also probably set yourself up um, just from a negotiation standpoint or, you know, a deal or kind of working the penalty back a little bit. Um, that might be part of it too. Well, the other big story that broke Monday and um, it's uncomfortable even talking about this, but it's something subject we shouldn't dodge, especially when the TDN has been doing this diversity series uh, about diversity in racing and the whole world is talking about diversity and the uh, racism as, as part of the fabric, not only of America, but the whole world. I don't know this individual. I've never met him. I know nothing about him. Uh, I don't know if Brian and, and John know him, but a person by the name of Tom Van Meter, who was a consigner in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, got nailed. Uh, somebody flagged a Facebook post that he put out, actually two of them that were, uh, someone was asking about people's opinions on the NFL, which of course is very controversial now with Colin Kaepernick and the kneeling and whatnot uh, and and everything that's going on there. And he posted, uh, I I can't repeat this uh, out there. Um, Well, I'll try to. Uh, One of the things he wrote on Facebook was defund the blank N word, you get the idea, uh, football league. Um, Just an abhorrent, awful, vile thing to write. And uh, he got nailed. Um, You know, first of all, I can't believe anybody really thinks that way. Maybe I'm naive to think that, uh, not to think that people just don't think that way anymore in the year 2020, but I can't believe anyone was so stupid to put that out on Facebook. And uh, I, I think, uh, you know, boy, I don't even know where to go with this, but but one thing is the, the industry um, reacted very swiftly and very strongly. I mean, everybody came out and condemned them. Um, the jockey club took away some privileges for him to be on one of the websites, et cetera. TDN said they will not take any more ads from him. Um, a dark moment in racing, but I guess the good news is that this was not 1954 where everybody just chuckled about it and said, hey, do you see what good old boy Tom did? Um, people kicked this guy in the ass pretty hard and give him, gave him what he deserved. Yeah, and, and Bill, I think the reason why it's such a, an important story to for us to discuss, as difficult as it is, um, is that the Van Meter family has a very rich 
history in our industry. If you drive through Lexington, there are actually roads that are named after the family. Um, that's how prominently, you know, positioned they are in, in the business. Um, and, and Tom, you know, individually was involved in all these different aspects of, of the industry and breeding and racing and, and signing and, and selling. And, and he's a prominent name. I mean, it, it's, it, it's not just, you know, some random guy who, who said something very inappropriate. Um, it's, it's a prominent leader who, you know, promotes himself as being a seventh generation Kentuckian. And has you know kids in the business and 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 you know supports the industry. But when an individual of this prominence goes down the road of vile and hateful talk um, for the public, especially, it, it's just that there's nowhere in the industry that this needs to be um, tolerated. And there were definitely sectors of the industry that came down clearly, swiftly, and decisively. And We've spoken on this industry, uh, we've spoken about different aspects within the industry about how wouldn't it be nice if the industry came together and moved forward on certain aspects of it, whether it's testing or whether it's trainer cheating or you know, anti laundering or anything in between. And the one little bit of, of, of hope and glimmer of hope out of this whole thing was that top organizations, Phasic Tipton, Keeneland, the TDN, the Jockey Club, um, the NTRA, all came out with comments and with immediate condemnation of these hateful, hateful comments. Yeah, I think one thing that was heartening was that there were very few people who stuck up for him. I don't really know how you could. Um, like Bill said, I don't know how you could be so stupid, honestly, to post something like that on social media. And I'm certain that he's not the only one who has those views and uses those words in the racing industry. But man, like it's amazing. It, social media has become just such a, it's hard to look at. It's hard to sign on. You just, you know, you think differently of a lot of people when you see just some of the ridiculous stuff they put up there. Um, but it was definitely good to see the pushback that he got. I guess we'll see if um, anything else happens with the sales companies and his consignment. I don't know how far they'll really go with that. Um, and his son, who's, he has, I think he has a number of children. He has one who's a trainer, but another one of his sons posted something on Facebook. I don't think he's in racing. That was really powerful and a good read. Um, kind of saying that his whole life, he's sort of grown up with this racist dad and he's, you know, it's been something he's kind of always grappled with. Um, I thought it was really interesting. So, you know, it's on, it's full, it's surround, it's floating on Facebook and Twitter. I think people have probably, you know, reposted it. I think it's an interesting perspective yeah, it was, was worth it was, reading. That's a good point, Brian. It was a son Griffin who who talked about today my dad wrote racist comments on a racist post on Facebook. Luckily he got called out for it as well as he should have. And, and it goes on and on to talk about, like you said, about his history of, you know, this wasn't a one off is basically what right. he's saying. It wasn't a situation where, you know, his dad, you know, accidentally sent something out. This apparently was his way of life and um the way that he, you know, tried to instill it to his his family. Um, and, and it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that, that, that you see a story like this um, and, and, and that in our industry where there are so many other things, you know, being addressed um, that now this is one of the thing that, that hopefully as an industry, we can come together and, and, and make better. I just want to add one more thing to it. And uh, I think uh, Brian sort of touched on this. Um, none of the sales companies banned him. Now, my guess is, and this is just a guess, is they probably had to go to their lawyers first and talk about what we can and cannot do. Uh, you know, as, as awful as this guy, uh, uh, what he did, it's not a crime to be stupid. And you still have uh, the right of freedom of speech in this country now, but the blowback uh, has been so intense. I don't think it really matters that the sales companies ban him because he's done. I mean, he's he's become toxic and nobody in their right mind would ever try to sell a horse through him. And I think a lot of people would refuse to buy horses from him. So uh, he is not going to be participating in the sales uh, coming up in the yearling sales later on in the year. Uh, that could be because the sales companies will not allow his consignment. Um, but I think it's more likely that he's just going to have to go away and work at Wendy's for the rest of his life. So, and, and get what he deserves. So. Bill, I'm not so sure that he won't be involved in um, upcoming sales. Uh, you know, he's a pretty big pin hooker, weanling the yearling pin hooker. Um, I'm sure he's got a lot of horses to sell. And, you know, those, I guess another interesting part is those nominations are already done. Um, I believe for both 
the phasing sale in September. And I think in September, I think they're already closed. Um, so it'll be interesting. I don't know how much moving around they can do. Uh, and the, it'll be interesting to see that the dynamic, if he does sell horses at this sale, at these upcoming sales, um, a lot of people have talked about blacklisting him, you know, are the horses going to get no bids? I can't imagine that. Obviously there'll be reserves. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if people do bid on them. If, you know, if there's a horse that's kind of undervalued in the ring, if it's going to be tough to resist for people. Uh, so it'll just be interesting to see what happens with the sales companies and then what happens at the actual sales if he is in fact involved. Yeah. And, and one last thing, and then, and then, you know, we, we can kind of table this, um, you know, for years we've opted as, as individuals with at DJ stable um, to not buy horses from certain consigners for various reasons, mostly because we thought that their business practices were, were, were not on the up and up. Um, but you as an individual, buyer have the right to solicit or not or not solicit um you know certain consigners so whereas i'm not recommending that that you do that but you do have the right to to opt and not even look at the horses and i know it's tantalizing when you see an asset in there you see a horse in there that should be bringing three or four times what it is and, and it's not bringing as much to go ahead and, and take a shot on it um but thankfully at these sales there are thousands of horses to, sh to, to shoot for um and to look at so, you know, Brian, I, I unfortunately I agree with you that he will probably pop up in the industry somehow, whether it's, you know, buying under a pseudo name or, or, or you know, buying in a partnership and, and kind of being a silent partner. But the Van Meter name won't be out there anymore. And as an industry, I think that's what we have to look for is to try to root out people that for whatever reasons um, are not good for the industry. Um, whether it's hateful speech or actions or, or just being unethical. Um, but regardless, you know, one of the opportunities that he had was to sell under his banner, under his name. Um, I mean, he didn't even use it under a, a stable name or a pseudo name. He, he sold under Van Meter. Well, he will never, ever be able to do that again in this industry. And, and that's some justice. It's not all the justice, but that is some justice right there that he won't be able to stand front and center and have his name uh, represented on these catalog pages. Well, just minutes ago, as a matter of fact, the TDN received a letter to the editor from Tom Van Meter. Here's why I think the best way to handle this. I'm just going to read it. We're not going to comment on it. Uh, the man does have the right, obviously, to have uh, his sentiments and his thoughts uh, aired. Um, again, freedom of speech and, and, and whatnot. And it is important here. I think, what he had to say. So I'm going to read this verbatim. Over the weekend, comments I made on a private page of a social media platform surfaced, which have since come under scrutiny due to the racist nature. I will not attempt to deny that I wrote the comments, nor will I attempt to justify my actions. Certainly, I am frustrated with the current social situation in our country. However, what I wrote was unjustifiable. I was wrong and am disgusted by my actions. Contrary to what these comments might suggest, in no way do those responses represent my true feelings toward my friends and community members of color. Moving forward, I am committed to listening and learning as how I can be a better ally and advocate in my community and within the racing industry as to how we can better foster inclusivity for all. In the meantime, as a gesture of goodwill, I have made a donation to the NAACP in support of the important work this organization continues to do. I'm hopeful all the industry stakeholders and the community at large can forgive me. I can and will do better. Sincerely, Tom Van Meter. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. And now a word from our friends, West Point Thoroughbreds. So as racing tries to deal with the pandemic and try to get more back to normal, several tracks now are allowing fans into the racetrack, uh, most of them on a limited basis. So on Sunday, I went out to Monmouth Park to just experience what a day at the track was like in the coronavirus uh, era. 
And I, I mean, the best word to put it is different. Um, you know, Monmouth, uh, it's not going to get 75,000 people on a Sunday, but the summer Sundays at the Jersey Shore and Brian and John are both Jersey Shore guys as well as I. We know it's, it's a very, uh, you know, really good atmosphere. There's life in the stands. There's a lot of people. People are enjoying themselves, having picnics. I got to tell you, to go out there was uh, and, and to be in this atmosphere was um, – I don't know what the right word is, but it was it was just not a lot of fun, I guess, is the way to put it. And now, again, I talk about racing like, you know, what's a Thursday like at Finger Lakes? Well, you know, that means there's 100 people in the stands. Now, for Monmouth, it got very complicated. They were trying to have as many as 15,000 people allowed into the racetrack. Governor comes back, says that's not going to go. They come up with this new formula where they would have somewhere between two and 3,000 people there. Um, how many people were there? I have no idea, but it was hot. Um, it was, uh, you know, I wore my mask the whole time, but I got to tell you, it was really uncomfortable in that heat, wearing it, you know, the sweat pouring out on your face. And, uh, you know, nobody, just no pizzazz in the stands or nothing to really get you that excited. And I got to imagine that's pretty typical of the experiences at all the racetracks that are allowing fans in. I mean, I don't know of any racetrack right now where there's 10,000 people going to the track. Most of them, are either not allowing fans or are allowing a, li a limited number of fans until we get to the Kentucky Derby and we'll see what's going to happen there. Um, you know, my guess is if things go according to plan, they're going to have at least 50,000 people there. But I don't know if you two guys have experienced it, but um, John, you know, it's not that wasn't you, you and Brian would both know this. It was not the Mammoth Park we know and love. Yeah. And then that's, and that's a shame. And I hope that it's a stepping stone. I hope that ultimately, you know, Monmouth Park opening their, their gates to, uh, you know, to the general public um, and having people kind of trickle in that naturally it will evolve into a more, you know, exciting atmosphere. Um, I'm just happy they're racing because we actually even had horses running or entered at Lone Star um, and they canceled racing, you know, indefinitely because of COVID, you know, cases um, increasing in Texas. So, you know, I, I have to look at it now as kind of a, the new normal glass half ball where, hey, we're racing at Monmouth. And if there's not fans there um, to, you know, to enjoy the atmosphere and be excited about, then that, that's kind of an unfortunate aspect of it. Uh, but I'm just really thankful that they're racing there um, and that the horses that we have in training are having an opportunity to compete and earn money and, and that the industry is kind of moving forward um, on the racing front because, for a long time there and brian you know because you have horses also there was only one racetrack open and, and you were you know you were i don't want to say life and death but you, you it was really difficult to get horses in a culture yeah and same thing at oakland when, you know they were open at the same time and it was really tough um i'm kind of with you uh i'm just happy to be racing uh with our partnership you know a lot of the guys like to go to the races and um, that's a big part of it for them from my perspective as long as they're running i'm happy you know it's a lot easier for me just but, you know, a lot of people, that's kind of the, the draw of being involved as an owner is getting to go to the track and either in the mornings or the afternoons. So, you know, any track that can allow that, I'm happy about. And it's good to see. Hopefully they continue to be careful and, you know, have these protocols and everything. Um, and it's I mean, it's funny here here. You know, we're not too far from Monmouth right now. Um, it definitely feels like kind of things are returning to normal a little bit, but it's still a long way to go. Um, and I don't, hopefully we don't backslide. I think we're one of the states that's doing pretty well. Um, and Kentucky, on uh, kind of interestingly, is, I think, doing better than almost any state um, in terms of, I think, cases are decreasing there. And they're, in most places, either stagnant or going up. Um, but let's hope we kind of continue on this trajectory. In some states, it's not looking that way, and it's a little scary. And obviously, you mentioned Lone Star in Texas. Um, but it's good to see... I mean, it's nice to see racing at Monmouth, hear Frank Miramati's voice, and you know, hopefully they can kind of have a problem-free meet as, as much as you can in this current situation. There was a funny, there was a funny sign, Bill, actually, that, that, that right, on the, uh, right in the barn area that said, um, in big, bold print, essential employees only. And then underneath it, it says, no owners. <laughs> <laughs> The one thing I wanted to add to that, and this comes up when Joe gave this impassioned speech last week about how important it was to wear masks. 
I was really surprised how many people were not wearing masks there. And, you know, Mammoth had said they're essential. They had talked about how this could be something that literally could shut them down if it got back to the governor's office, that people were running around without masks. And, you know, it seemed to get worse as the day went on, maybe because people were getting hot or maybe because there was monkey see, monkey do. If the guy sitting next to you is not wearing a mask, what the hell am I going to wear one to? But, um, you know, first of all, people, come on, let's do a better job than that. And, um, you know, I was a little surprised that Mammoth really didn't seem to be doing anything enforce this, which I think is it was playing with fire a little bit. But hopefully, um, you know, things will be onward and upward at Monmouth and uh, won't have to worry about this as uh, New Jersey is doing pretty well with the coronavirus, as Brian said. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more at www.greenco.com. Somebody who needs no introduction, our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is Gabby Gaudette from TVG. She's getting ready to work the Keeneland meet, and we're pleased to have her. Gabby, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing very well. I'm very, very excited for the Keeneland July meet to kick off. Um, I finally get to leave the house and actually be at a racetrack. So that's at least one thing that's uh, very exciting. Well, this is something we're all looking forward to, but we know it's a very different Keeneland meet from normal. Not only is it in uh, July, which has never happened before, but there won't be fans allowed into the stands. So in able to make the experience as good as possible, Keeneland is doing what they call Keeneland at home. We had Royal Ascot at home as well. And I, I think the idea is if people can't come to the track, let's make the experience as good as possible for people who are in their living rooms, be it in Lexington or around the country. So tell us more about Keeneland at home and how they are going to to enhance the experience for people that want to tune into the Keeneland races? Well, we're, I guess for starters, Scott Hazelton and I, we're doing all of the simulcast and we're enhancing the simulcast. So we're essentially going to start from the time that the horses entered the paddock, give it to Kurt Becker for the call, and then even do some stuff after the race too. So we're enhancing the simulcast coverage. We're enhancing some of the... Also, because of the media isn't a majority of the media isn't going to be allowed at Keeneland. We're trying to up the interviews to whether it's the post race winner interviews or maybe uh, post race loser interviews if a heavy favorite doesn't win. So we're trying to provide as much information for the media and for the fans and for the public uh, who cannot be on site. And also there's the entertainment and the fun element. I know Keeneland is, is posting some of their famous recipes like burgoo, which burgoo in July doesn't sound too appetizing, but print it out and put it in the cookbook for later. Um, but also, you know, there's a lot of things online for fans. And most importantly, Keelan is posting the past performances online for each of the five day uh, race days uh, online. So free past performances online that fans can go online and check out. So a, a couple of things like that, just to, you know, make it a bit easier. Of course, I know people miss Keeneland and Miss Bean on track and hopefully we'll be back in the fall. Who knows where we'll be then. But, you know, I think this kind of eases that transition a little bit for those passionate fans at home. And Gabby, John Green, thanks so much for, for being on on the cusp of a really exciting mini meet at Keeneland. We appreciate your time. The great races that are coming up at Keeneland, I believe there are eight or nine graded stake races um, on the docket for the weekend. Is there one race in particular that you're looking forward to not only you know being involved with, but also interviewing people on and, and watching as a fan? I'm really excited for the Maker's Mark Mile on Friday. I always love that race every single year, but this year in particular, um, you know, at least according to the nominations, Raging Bull without parole, uh, War of Will, these three horses, they went against each other in the Shoemaker Mile at Santa Anita and Raging Bull was just absolutely sensational in that race, but with that parole had a brutal trip. And I thought it was a good race for War of Will, and he's come out of the race really well. I've been speaking to David Carroll, who's Mark's assistant at Churchill Downs, and he's been working well. He's come out of the race well. So I think that's going to be a really fun race. And then also, you know, the bluegrass is interesting, especially if Swiss Skydiver, if Kenny McPeaks decide to run her in that race, it'd be very interesting to see a Philly take on the boys in the bluegrass. Um, the Ashland is turning up to be a really nice race. And then, of course, some of these two-year-old races, I was looking at the Wednesday and the Thursday cards. I love 
baby races. And I'm so happy that I can at least be on site and in the paddock to see these horses in the flesh as well. So uh, yeah, two-year-old races, and then of course, some of those marquee grade ones. And Gabby, have you had other experiences uh, through the pandemic at racetracks without fans? And if so, what's that been like? And uh, in general, what are you expecting? It's certainly going to be a strange atmosphere. I mean, Keeneland is not like a Thursday afternoon at Podunk Downs. This is a place where, you know, you're so used to tens of thousands of people in the stands and everybody having a great time. And and the Lexington community loves their horses so much. I mean, obviously, there's it's no one's fault and there's nothing you can do about it. But geez, I got to think it's going to be strange. It will be strange. So, you know, I haven't been to a a race meet or during live, I haven't been to a racetrack during a live race day um, since March, March 19th, something like that. It might have been the last day at Gulfstream. Um, So I think that's going to be strange. I'll be honest, this past weekend, we were doing live hits from Keeneland and it was just It was just me and my camera person. Um, There was absolutely nobody around. And even that was very strange. It was strange to leave the house and do work because I haven't done it in the past couple of months. And then it's going to be strange to interview people too and just be around people and the horses and everything. I have gone out in the mornings a couple of times just with my husband, just at the barn helping out. Um, But yeah, I have not been to a live race meet since Gulfstream uh, back in March. So it will be strange, especially for Keeneland. As you said, I'm used to, you know, elbowing people out of the way for this this spring and the fall meet. And, uh, you know, obviously it's going to be uh, very different this coming week. And Gabby, you mentioned your husband, Norm Cassie, and certainly your sister, uh, Lacey uh, Gaudet, is uh, doing really well in Maryland as well. And and then your dad was a legend here in the Mid-Atlantic in, in Maryland, um, winning all the races that he did. Are you noticing over the years different things that your dad did versus your sister versus Norm um, as far as getting horses ready for some of these bigger races? Oh, yeah. For sure. And not even getting horses ready for the bigger races. It's almost like a day to day thing too. Uh, you know, sometimes most of the time, the, the really good horses, they can be the easy ones to get ready for races. It's the, the horses that are, you know, in the claiming ranks that uh, win uh, that run frequently, it's kind of maintaining those and it's maintaining all of these types of different horses, right at the lower level, the mid level, and of course, at the high level too. Um, so Growing up, my dad, he was always tinkering with things. Like if if a horse didn't run well, he would always find um, a reason why the horse didn't run well. And he, I can remember him like going into the garage and welding like a bridle and just trying to figure things out. And he was a true horseman. And I feel like my sister and myself, we've learned a lot from him. And then, you know, the other side of the spectrum uh Norm learned a lot from his dad, not only in the beginning stages before they had, you know, the Teppins and the classic empires and that evolution too. I think he learned from all of that as well. So yeah, I think the biggest thing is just learning and being an assistant and opening yourself up to different types of horses and and being okay with being wrong sometimes, but learning from that experience. And I think both he and my sister have learned that in the last couple of years. And Gabby, we want to remind all our viewers and listeners that the TDN will be taking the feed from Keeneland right on the website. So you don't need an ADW account. There's no charge, of course. If you want to uh, watch the Keeneland races and, and hear Gabby doing the uh, simulcast presentation throughout the day, along with the other people in her crew, Scott Hazelton, just go to the TDN website and it's right there. Uh, Gabby, taking away from the immediacy of the Keeneland meet, you made some history back in January when you were an announcer at the Keeneland January sales, uh, believed to be the first time any female has ever done that. Tell us about that experience and what was that like and do would you like to do more of it yes I would definitely like to do more of it and I believe I might be doing some more at the September sale I haven't confirmed that with anybody but I believe that's in the pipeline that whole experience was such a whirlwind and honestly because of the pandemic it feels like that happened maybe five years ago if I'm being completely honest uh it was a whirlwind not only because of the immense pressure that was that was like surrounding all of that. I mean, it it was a historic moment. Um, And then on top of that, the following week, 
I, you know, I was co-hosting um, or emceeing the Eclipse Award. So there was a lot of preparation, a lot going on during that particular time. But I can remember, um, you know, sitting in, in the room um, with all the consigners coming in and out, giving their updates, having conversations with them, talking to uh, the sales crew and uh, this, them just giving me advice and helpful tips. And I think everybody knew that I was nervous. I knew I was nervous. This is a true story. I like went into the bathroom and just like talked myself down because I was just so nervous because of the, you know, it was a lot of pressure. And um, it, what, once I was up there, it's just keeping that momentum and just having confidence. I think that's the most important thing is just when you're up there, you have to have confidence because it goes by so quickly. Um, so yeah, keeping up the tempo and, and that confidence. But it was, um, it was definitely a whirlwind. I guess that's the only way to describe it. And I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to doing it again because I feel like I can tackle it with a little bit more confidence the second time around. Gabby, one of the things that we've been talking about um, during the pandemic, especially, has been, you know, the the important role that women and minority play in the industry. Um, as a prominent woman in the industry, how would you recommend that the uh, the industry as a whole, both racing and the breeding industries, um, try to encourage, you know, additional uh, input and and additional positions of power, um, you know, for minorities and for women. I think it just starts with a conversation, really. And I think that's where we're all at right now is discussing the problems that we've had in this industry for decades. Um, so beginning with that conversation, and I also think making people aware what's happening, right? Trying to put themselves uh, in the shoes of those minorities and get there, see and understand their perspective as well and having those conversations. Um, so I think we have a long way to go, but that's probably the best place to start. And then obviously, hopefully from there, um, we can enact change. Gabby, I want to sort of piggyback on what John said and ask you a similar question. You're obviously not a trainer, but everything in your family tree is all about trainers, from your husband to your parents to your sister. And the idea of females succeeding in this business, one area where they certainly have not done as well as I think maybe the, the group set of females would like is in the training profession. I mean, Linda Rice does an, a phenomenal job, but a female's never won a triple crown race. Uh, we really don't have many females uh, knocking heads with the Chad Browns, Todd Pletchers, and Bob Bafferts of the world. Maybe from something you've picked up, maybe from something that your sister said. What do you think are the impediments to more success for females in the training ranks? No, that's a really good question. And I don't know if I can confidently answer it, but I know from speaking, you know, from having conversations with my sister, um, I don't know why she, she always has had support from many of her owners. Um, has she reached out to, you know, the, the owners that give horses to Chad Brown and Todd Pletcher? No, I don't know if it's, because she doesn't, she wouldn't feel comfortable with that. I, I'm really not sure what that barrier is and how females can break it, at least in the, in the training, um, in the area of training horses. So it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think it's just having the business behind you and, and, you know, having the confidence to reach out. I mean, I've, I've at least, there are females that are starting to, you know, there are more females that are starting to grow, say my sister, I mean, she's gotten a lot more clients over the past couple of years. Um, you know, Linda Rice, of course, she's leading trainer Saratoga one year, uh, Shri Devo, you know, she's getting some pretty top clients as well. Um, but yeah, it's definitely limited. And I, I hope we can change that culture moving forward. No, that's great. I, I think that's that's been the big difference in the industry over the past few months, even has been to try to focus on, um, you know, just like you said, identifying that there is an issue and then trying to, to formulate plans um, to try to, you know, expedite the process and try to make it more fairer, um, you know, for for everybody. Um, and, and that's a positive thing. When you are interviewing people this weekend um, at Keeneland, is that going to be something in the back of your mind where maybe if there is an opportunity to um, to emphasize or, or promote 
um, either somebody of color or, or, or a woman that maybe, you know, we have a chance to give them a little bit more time. Cause it, it seems like that the, the audience that's watching the races in our industry and certainly the feedback that we're getting here at the TDN is that they want, you know, they want more promoted, um, in, in those aspects of the industry. I always feel like I try my very best to interview and this is just, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with what's happening right now from the time I started, uh, you know, back in whatever year it was, 2012, 2013, I've always tried to interview the story or um, the person who, you know, might be 30 to one in a race, but has a story and, you know, he's worked just as hard to get his horse to the starting gate as the one to nine you know, whatever runner in there. So yeah, I think I've, I'd like to say, you know, that I've always tried to do that. Um, and we'll continue to do that, especially during this coming meet. Great. And Gabby, I just have one more, sorry, Bill, just if I can jump in. Um, you're, you've been in the industry, you know, your whole life and you studied, you know, journalism communication at, at Towson. What advice would you give to the next generation of, you know, Gabby got at wannabes, people who want to be on the air, people who want to be involved in the industry. Um, is there is there a nugget or a piece of, of advice that you would give a young Gabby God that who's who's maybe on the cusp of, of getting into broadcasting? Work hard, work hard, ask questions and don't pretend that you know everything because you won't get very far. Um, I can remember when I was working for the Saratoga special, it was my first summer I was working in, it was, it was kind of a crazy uh, situation because although I did major in, in mass communications, I, I was a double major in graphic design, uh, in college. And I thought I was going to be in advertising, a graphic design and advertising. And I had plenty of internships that were going to lead me in that direction. And Sean Clancy from the Saratoga special gives me a call one summer and says, Hey, why don't you come up here and write for the paper? And that completely, in my opinion, changed the course of my life. And that one summer, there was an older individual. He was a trainer, Manny Asperua. And he had a filly running in one of the stakes races at Saratoga. And he said, let's say he was, uh, you know, 76. Uh, I forget exactly how old he was, but he said 76 is 76. And the, my biggest pet peeve is when kids come in here and say, I know, I know, I know. No, you don't know. I'm 76 years old and I've been doing this for years and I, I'll never know everything. And that still sticks with me. And I try to carry that on every single day in, in this career and my job. I mean, I've got books I still read about confirmation and lameness and horses and, you know, just you, you're always a student of the game. And when you, when you don't think that anymore, then, you know, you're stuck. So that's really the, the most important thing is just to try to educate yourself and ask questions and don't pretend that you know everything because it's definitely not the case. <laughs> So, Gabby, I saved my really hard-hitting, tough question for last. About 10 minutes ago, who was that dog that walked behind you? The dog? Yeah. You didn't see it, unless you have eyes in the back of your head. Your dog walked right behind you in the shot. He, his name's Waylon, uh -huh. and he is like a person, honestly. <laughs> it's, it, it's been, you know, he's been pretty well behaved throughout this whole pandemic. There was one day, though, uh, where the he something was outside, and he's very excited, and he started, like, he's a beagle mix so he has this crazy uh you know whining sound that comes out of his mouth and uh people were like texting me and tweeting and saying is your dog okay should we call like the humane society i said no he's fine um but yeah he, he we adopted him a couple years ago and he is something for sure very good. Well, once again, the Keeneland Meet, which starts Wednesday and runs through the Sunday, the weekend, is available right on the TDN website, a new perk for the TDN. You don't need an ADW account. You don't have to make a bet. You don't have to pay any fee, anything like that. You can catch Gabby Gaudet and the rest of her team uh, broadcasting from Keeneland, what is going to be a very exciting five days of race. And Gabby, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Good luck this meet. Thank you. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As the Green Group Guest of the Week, Gabby Gaudet will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at www.greenco.com. And now a message from our friends at The Green Group. 
The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. I want to thank our Green Group guest of the week, Gabby Gradet, for joining us. And once again, we got through it, even with a skeleton crew. But I want to thank John Green and Brian DiDonato for uh, helping me out on this week's TDN Writers Room podcast. Also, a shout out and thanks to our editorial staff, the editors, Nathan Wilkinson and Anthony LaRocco, Michelle Sabrina, and our producer, Patty Wolf. Also, of course, we want to thank Keelan. Reminder that their five-day special summer meet begins Wednesday, runs through Sunday at the Bluegrass Ashland. Uh, excuse me, at the Bluegrass Stakes, the Ashland, the Makers Mark Mile. Great racing at Keelan coming up this weekend. Thanks, everybody. 